Well, good evening. Welcome to Livingstone 6 o'clock service on this beautiful Sunday. Uh, my name is Ken Van Bergen. I'll be sharing with you tonight. Um, we're, we're in session two of a three-session series covering Paul's missionary journeys as recorded in uh, the book of Acts. And so tonight we're going to do a, a little review of what we covered last week. And then we're going to um, continue with his journeys um, on his second missionary journey. And we're going to start his third. And then next week we're going to finish the third. And it's actually a fourth. Uh, the first three were voluntary. The last one he went to prison. So it wasn't voluntary. But it was quite the, quite the journey. And God used him in some very um, spectacular ways. We'll get to that next week. Um, so let's go ahead and um, start our review. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Apostle Paul. Um, the Apostle Paul, uh, next slide please, is the core figure in our narrative today as recorded in the book of Acts 13 through um, 28. And so we went through a little bit of this last week, but I wanted to just uh, break it down a little bit and, and review who Paul actually is. So Paul was actually born in about AD 5, the year 5 AD, and he was born an Israelite, but he was a Roman citizen, so he was born in the city of Tarsus in the province of Cilicia, which is in today's southern Turkey. And he was born to his dad was a Pharisee. He was a religious scholar. Um, and so Paul grew up as, in his dad's footsteps, and he uh, studied Judaism and became very uh, profound in his teaching. He actually studied under Gamaliel in um, Jerusalem uh, for many years. And so he was very prominent in his faith as a Pharisee. He was so um, into his belief system that when the way came, or the, what they called the way of the Christians, he persecuted them violently. He actually would go and get letters from the high priest and go hunt down Christians throughout the different areas of Judea and Syria. And he was actually on his way to Syria, to Damascus, to um, arrest some Christians, and that's when Jesus appeared, and we have what's called Paul's conversion. It happened in about A.D. 37. One thing when you study the book of Acts and, and the New Testament in general, I mean, the whole Bible is good to know timelines and um, context. But in the book of Acts especially, if, if you really get a, a f fundamental uh, foundation of when things happen in what sequence, who the characters are and where the places are, where the provinces are, where the cities are, it really fits in to, to form this narrative. And it, there's no other belief system in the world that has that as their religious texts. These are real people in real places with a real story. So as we go through this um, session today and, and, and in two weeks, our, our final session, I really want to try to lay out the timelines and how it all fits together. Because then when you read the epistles or the letters that Paul wrote, it really forms a story and you can get more meaning out of it. You can get more meaning out of it. So he gets his conversion about AD 37 um, and then he starts preaching the gospel. And he, he became the biggest evangelism the world's ever seen. And he would go to the synagogues and preach Jesus from the Old Testament. And so he had these three missionary journeys. You can see them on the, on the second line here. The gray journey was what we covered last week. And that was his, um, him and Barnabas went to uh, what's called Galatia and planted some, some uh, churches there. And we'll cover that in a little bit in review. And then we ended at the end of, um, of that last week. And so today, later, we're going to pick up on his second missionary journey, which is in the pink. That's about a two and a half year period that, that both journeys are a little over two years. And then there's a little break, and then he starts his third missionary journey in the green. That's a much longer journey. That's about a five year journey. Um, and then he returns to Jerusalem, and we end up in the bottom line, in the timeline. And he's arrested in Jerusalem, spends a couple years there. And then he appeals to Caesar, and that's when he goes on his uh, trip to Rome. And under Nero, he was put to death in about 68 AD. Uh, but before that, um, he wrote a bunch of letters and, and, and did a bunch of ministry, and we'll cover that next week. But this is Apostle Paul. He's a very unique character. He was um, divinely appointed for this position. Uh, the fact that he's a Roman citizen and a Pharisee uniquely um, were unique gifts or unique circumstances that allowed him to do what Jesus and God called him to do. No one else could really do what he did because he, he, cause he just fit, he, his zealous, his understanding of the law, and the fact he's a Roman citizen, you see that again and again throughout the narrative as you go through the journeys. So the more you understand Paul's background and his timeline, the more you're going to gravitate or pull out of the book of Acts, and especially his epistles, the letters that he writes. Next slide. 
Last week we reviewed the Old Testament a little bit. You can watch the video online if you want to maybe review or if you didn't see it. But these are the 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, it's broken up in five, five areas. You have the Gospels or narratives, which is the, the narrative of Jesus' life and ministry. Um, two are written by disciples, Matthew and John. And two are written by characters we meet in the book of Acts, uh, Mark and Luke. And Luke actually wrote Acts as well. And then we have the church history, which we're studying uh, tonight in, in the book of Acts. And then you have these letters. Now, all these letters, at least the Pauline letters, the 13 letters that Paul wrote, fit in the book of Acts. They, they all fit in the book of Acts, except for the last couple he wrote after the book of Acts. So the book of Acts ends, Paul's still alive. And he writes 2 Timothy and Titus. But, but most of them fit into that. So as you go through these journeys, you're going to see when he wrote them and who he wrote them to, and you can put the context in. And it's very important when you study scripture, when you study anything, actually, to have context. Because uh, without context, that's what defines the meaning. If you have, don't have the context, then you're not going to get the right meaning. And that applies to anything you're learning. And then you have, so you have these 13 letters that Paul wrote, nine to churches and four to individuals. And then you have the general epistles um, written by uh, other authors, Peter, John, Jude, and James. And you have this book of Hebrews. A lot of scholars think Paul wrote Hebrews. This particular chart has them not writing it because it's debatable. Because there's an unknown author, it's not signed by anybody. So I believe Paul wrote it, but based on what I know, but maybe not. But those are the, and then we have Revelation that John wrote at the end. And so those are the 27 books of the New Testament. We're going to be focusing on the book of Acts and Pauline's letters in this series. And then uh, next year we're going to do a series actually on the epistles or the letters themselves and get into the text and see what he actually wrote. But before you do that, like I say, the better grasp you have on the book of Acts and the journeys where he went and the circumstances he wrote them under, the more you're going to pull out of the actual epistles. Okay? Make sense? So I'm going to plant a couple seeds uh, as we go forward, just, just something to think about. One I already said, context to find meaning. Everything we, we're going to talk about, you have to put it in context. So I'm going to try to put all the narratives of the Paul's journeys in context so you can really kind of maybe pull some deeper meaning that you might not have picked up before. But whenever you study scripture, you have to know what the context is, or you're never, you know, scripture is layered. Yeah, you can read a scripture and get blessed by it. God can speak you through a scripture. But the more you know the context, the author who he's writing to, the language, the more you're going to pull out of it, because there's deeper meanings to, uh, to these, um, to God's, to the, the Bible, to the God's writings, than just surface level. So the more context you have, the more meaning you're going to get. The other thought I wanted to plant with you is, if you tolerate everything, you stand for nothing, right? If you tolerate everything, you stand for nothing. And that goes across the board in life. And Paul certainly didn't tolerate everything, as we're going to find out. He definitely didn't tolerate false teaching, and neither should we, right? You have to take a stand on something, or it doesn't mean anything. So if you tolerate everything, you stand for nothing. So just keep those two things in the back of your mind as we go through tonight's session. For one to fully grasp what Paul was preaching, they have to understand that he received what the message directly from Jesus Christ. He says that in Galatians. What I received, I did not receive from man. I received from God directly. And so and what did he preach? Well, he preached Jesus out of the Old Testament. That was a message that Paul took throughout the known world, through, through Galatia and all the provinces in Asia and off to Rome is he preached Jesus from the Old Testament because that's who Jesus said he was. And we covered that a little bit last week. So once again, if you want to review that, you can. But Jesus even said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. That was his mission. That's, that's what he was here for. Yes, he came to die for our sins and to be the Savior of the world, but it was more than that. It wasn't just some guy showed up claiming to be God and rose from the dead, and if you believe in him, you're saved. Not that that's untrue, but there's more to that. We have texts that was written hundreds and hundreds of years before he came that point to the details of each one of his whole life. And he fulfilled each one of them to the T. And when you can point to that, then you can, then it's deeper than just, uh, just somebody showing up. There's actually written texts hundreds of years before that pointed to his exact time, where, when, how. And that's what Jesus said. I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill what Moses wrote about. And the prophets wrote about. That's why I'm here. Because you understand what Moses wrote about. If you understand the law of the Israelites, you understand there's this thing called sin, which you wouldn't understand without the law. If Paul just went out and started preaching repent from your sins, people wouldn't know what he's talking about, unless you're Jewish. 
Because that's where you learn what sin is, is in, is in the law. And then they had all these ceremonies and things to, to um, come, overcome sin, right? That's what all the, all the traditions and so forth, which we're going to show in a minute. But Jesus said very clearly, I came to fulfill this. I'm not... I'm here to fulfill the law. And then the mystery was that the Gentiles will be grafted into Israel and the Gentiles will be saved too through Christ's um, sacrifice. Next slide. So the Old Testament is full, full of things pointing to Jesus. We're just going to touch on a couple here today because that's a whole different study. This is the Jewish calendar overlapping our calendar. They have 12 months as well, but their 12 months don't exactly match ours. And you have these seven feasts laid out Leviticus. In the Old Testament, in the Law of Moses. You have the spring feasts, which are Passover, unleavened bread, the first fruits, and Pentecost, which is later in the spring. And you have the fall feasts, tabernacles, atonement, and trumpets. Jesus fulfilled each one of these. There's, there's, there's so much deep meaning in these uh, feasts in the Mosaic Law that Jesus came to fulfill. So when he said, I came to fulfill the law, this is part of what he was talking about. He came to atone for sin through what the law had dictated, only he actually did it. Next slide. We know about the prophecies. This is 12 prophecies that point to Jesus' birth, his death. He'd be betrayed by a friend, not a bone would be broken. There's over 300 prophecies that point to Jesus in the Old Testament. This is just a, a handful. But when he says that came to fulfill the prophets, Jesus talking, this is what he was talking about. It was written about him hundreds of years before he came. No other belief system in the world has that. No other religion has a before and after. I said it last week, and I'll say it again this week, because as Christians, we, we got to know this. What we believe just isn't another faith. It's not another belief system. It's not a philosophy like Buddhism. It's certainly not Mormonism, written by one man, one book. It's not Islam. It's the fulfillment of the Old Testament in the person of Jesus Christ. Next slide. And then he also had... You know, the tabernacle um, was something that God gave the, um, the Israelites when they were in the exile, or in the exodus, excuse me. And he commanded them to build this, to this, this place that God would meet his people. This was a prelude to the temple, which came hundreds of years later, which was a prelude to Jesus. And there's scripture to support that, but that's not for this study. But I wanted to point to here, when Jesus, the tabernacle was pointing to Jesus. As we read in Hebrews... 9 and verses 11 and 12, and you need to listen to this because this is very, it's kind of at the crux of what we believe as Christians. But when Christ came as a high priest, well, you wouldn't know what a high priest is unless you knew what Judaism, that's the whole definition and meaning there, of good things that are already, that are, okay, but when Christ came as a high priest of good things that were now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not the one that was made with human hands, as the Israelites built. That is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter the, by means of blood of goats and calves, because in Judaism you had the sacrifices, right? You had to have innocent mud, innocent blood to cover sins. And that's why Jesus said, I'm the lamb that saved, I'm, he's, a, he's a sacrificial lamb that came to save the world. He is the Passover lamb. That's all Old Testament context. He did not enter by the means of goats, blood of goats and calves, But he entered the most holy place, because in the tabernacle you had the outer chamber, and then you had the most holy place. Only the high priest could go in there once a year in the temple to meet God. He had entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. When he died on the cross, he was fulfilling all the Old Testament sacrifices as spelled out in the Mosaic Law. That's what he meant when he said, I came to fulfill the Law and the Prophets. And there's a lot more to that. This is, I'm just trying to plant some seeds. Because it's, if you don't understand this, you're not going to understand Paul's message. That's why we're, we're going through this. You have to understand this because this is what Paul preached. This is all Paul preached, actually, in his missionary journeys. Then he wrote the letters to define how we should live and we'll, the epistles. But this is what Paul preached. Jesus was the Messiah of Israel, and then the Gentiles were grafted in. So you have to know what that is. Okay? Next slide. And then to summarize this, Paul writes in Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Christ died for nothing. But Christ had to die because that's the only way we could attain the righteousness because no one else could. No one else could. Okay. 
All right, switch gears a little bit. Next slide. As you go through the book of Acts, you're going to meet some characters. There's a lot of characters, but I just want to introduce you to some of these guys who's going to see them again. And you're also going to see them in the epistles. You're going to see them in the letters that are written um, by uh, Paul and also by Peter and others. Uh, we have the Apostle Paul, which we've talked about. We have this guy named Barnabas. We met Barnabas last week. Paul met Barnabas in chapter 9 after he was converted. He went to Jerusalem, and, and Barnabas was helping him, and then they... The, he went up to, uh, back up to Tarsus and then it met Barnabas in Antioch. And they went on the first missionary journey together. And then we have John Mark, which is Barnabas' younger cousin. We meet John Mark in chapter 12 of Acts. Um, remember the story when Peter was arrested uh, and thrown in prison. And then the, miraculously the angel opened the prison and, G and Peter walked right out. It was kind of like a Star Wars thing where the stormtroopers were standing there and they walk by, they wave their hand, and they don't see anything. That's what he said. He walked right past the guards. He walked right out. The gate opened. And then he goes to this house, knocks on the door, and the servant girl says, who is it? He goes, it's Peter. And she said, she got so excited, she didn't open the door, ran back and told everybody in the house, Peter's here. And they said, no, he's not. What are you talking about? And then they opened the door. Well, that was John Mark's mother's house. And the reason I bring that up is it shows that they were part, his family was part of the early Christian community in, in, in um, Jerusalem. And he, he plays a prominent uh, uh, part in the New Testament. You know, he's young here, and we met him last week. He also traveled with Barnabas and Paul on part of their journey, but then they got to Perga, and, at, and he left. He went back to Jerusalem, which becomes contention later, but uh, I'm not sure why he left. Speculation is he just, it was too hard. It was too hard. And then we have Silas. Uh, we meet Silas today in chapter 15. He's in um, Jerusalem, uh, an early believer, and he plays a huge part in Paul's missionary journey. As a matter of fact, uh, on the second journey that Paul goes on, we're going to cover here, he's with Silas. And they go and, and have an adventure together, sharing God's word. And then if you look at Peter, I think it is, Silas actually brings Peter's letter to the churches. Peter wrote a letter in First Peter to the churches in Dysphoria. If you look at who he wrote to, it's all the guys we're studying about now in Acts. Pontus, Galatia, uh, Asia, all the, all the provinces we're looking at now, that's who Peter wrote to. So if you know that... When you read Peter, you're going to have context of who he's talking to. And so what he says has meaning because there's, there's purpose there. And then uh, Lydia, or then there's Timothy. We're going to meet him tonight. And Lystra, uh, as a young man, he plays a huge part in the church. We're going to pick him up today in Lystra when he's, when he's young. And then later on, he becomes the pastor of the church at Ephesus. So when Paul wrote First and Second Timothy... Later in Paul's ministry, right before he died, he was writing to Timothy as a man, grown man, as he oversaw one of the most important churches in Christendom at the time, which is the church at Ephesus. Now, Lydia is the first convert in Europe. We're going to meet her tonight in Philippi. And then we meet these characters called Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila is the guy's name, in case you're wondering. I was confused at first. And uh, Paul meets them in Corinth. They were Jews that were banished from Rome. They were tent makers like Paul. And so they, they worked together, and they, Paul went over, and they actually started the church at Ephesus. And then Apollos is this character we're going to meet at, in chapter 18. He comes from Alexandria. He goes to Ephesus. He's preaching Jesus. Very powerful. Aquila and Priscilla teach them what they learned from Paul. And then he goes to Corinth, and it says he argued vehemently to the Jews preaching Jesus from the Old Testament. It was a very powerful preacher. This guy named Apollos. And we see him again in the letter to Titus. And so... I don't expect you to memorize all this. I'm just trying to plant some seeds so you because there's a story here. And the more you know about the characters and the places, the more context you're going to have and the more you're going to get from the story. Next slide. So these are the two journeys uh, that we're going to cover. The first one we already covered, and then we're going to cover the second one. In red is what we um, covered last week, as you recall. All three of Paul's missionary journeys start in Antioch. Antioch was one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire at the time. Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch were the biggest cities. So it was a very large metropolis, and the church was flourishing there. That was actually the home base of the church at the time. And so they go, I think, on this, this, this boat trip to um, uh, Salamis and Paphos on Cyprus, and they hop over to Perga, and they go to Antioch. That's where Paul preached, and it was so powerful, the whole city showed up to hear the message, and he preached Jesus from the Old Testament. But then the Jews got jealous, and they ran him out of town. So they ran to Iconium, went to the synagogue, preached Jesus from the Old Testament. It's a, very, it's a pattern we're going to see all, through, all three of his journeys. Some believed, and some didn't. Some were offended. Some Jews were offended, and some saw it. 
kind of how it is today. That's, that's just human nature. Some people believe in Christ and some people don't. But same message. Um, but he goes to Icon, same thing. They run him out. He goes to Lystra. It says he got to Lystra and the, the Jews from Antioch and Iconium followed him to Lystra and caused a ruckus and they actually stoned him. And it says they left him for dead. This is Paul's first missionary journey. He's just getting started. And he's already been stoned and they leave him for dead. But then it says the disciples went and pick, picked him up, brought him back. And the next day, not two or three weeks later, the next day he got up and went to uh, Derby. And they preached there. And then he actually went right back to the same places. He just went Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, um, Perga. And then he sailed directly back um, to Antioch. There's two Antiochs. There's one in Pisidia and one in Syria. Just a little confusing. But Syria is the home base. Antioch and Pisidia is where um, they planted a church. And that's where he left off last week. All right, so Paul and Barnabas got back from this trip. They had a lot, read, read the text, a lot of miracles, a lot of healings, and the church is being planted. This is the beginning of the Gentile church. This is the beginning of our church. This is the beginning of our story as non-Jewish Christians. It was right here on this first missionary journey 2,000 years ago. In order to understand uh, also the book of Acts and Paul's missionary journeys and the Christianity we have today, you really have to have a good grasp on Acts chapter 15. It's kind of an in-between chapter. It's in between the first journey and the second journey. And we're going to go through, the, we're going to read the whole chapter, but I have a few slides we're going to go through because you've got to hear what's being said because this, this changes the direction of Christianity, this one chapter changes the f direction of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was going this way, and now it's going this way, and I'll tell you what I mean. Um, so the, Paul and Barnabas go. They have this council in Jerusalem, um, and then uh, let's go ahead and just go through the text. Next slide. So that's Antioch. That's Jerusalem, right? Two main hubs of Christianity at the time. But the church had, because of persecution, and remember in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5, a lot of persecution, well, they scattered, right? Well, they went up and they were up in Antioch, and now that's kind of the, the hub. And that's where the um, Bible says a lot of prophets and, and, and elders up there, and um, that's where Paul and Barnabas are, are based out of. But the leadership and the apostles are still in Jerusalem, the ones that are still alive at this point, because some have already been martyred. And the Bible says they came up from Jerusalem, but they actually came down. It's just, they have it backwards, but could we go north and south, but... Here's the text, chapter 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, so they went from Jerusalem to Antioch. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they're teaching them that, you know, we believe in Jesus too, but you got to be circumcised and basically follow the law to be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Do new believers have to be circumcised? Basically, do they have to follow the law? So being sent on their way by the church, so the church of Antioch sent them off, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, which is in the middle, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all their brothers. So they went, as they, along the way, they stopped with bro where church where brothers were and told them about all the, their first journey, basically, and all that had happened on their first journey. And they had great joy. Next slide, verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. Again, their first journey. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, those are the religious leaders, that's what Paul was one of, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise, circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, know, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. And he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed 
having been cleansed by their faith. Next slide, verse 10. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test, placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? So Paul's challenging, or excuse me, Peter's challenging them. Why are you, God's made it clear. This is for everyone. Why are you trying to put this yoke on their neck that we can't carry and our fathers couldn't carry? But we believe that we will be saved through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. And all the assembly, assembly folk uh, silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, this is James, Jesus' brother, who wrote the book of James. Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them a people for his name. And with the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. So it's talking about restoring uh, Israel with something better. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes things, who makes these things known from old. So he's quoting Old Testament. Verse 19. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them and abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. Those four things. And from ancient generations, Moses had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read on the Sabbath in all the synagogues. And in the rest of chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Bar uh, I think it's Barsabbas, someone else, another, a couple of disciples go back to Jerusalem, back to Antioch, and they bring this letter written by, the, um, by James and Peter and the elders saying, this is what we dec decree. And basically from that point on, it was not expected for Christians, new converts, to be circumcised or to be under the Mosaic law. And that was great rejoicing in Antioch because <laughs> no one wanted to get circumcised. But, um, so, but that, was a sh that was a switch because it was now a definable point where the Christianity, Jesus' blood covers sins of everybody. And you do nothing but receive it on faith. On faith. Not everybody liked that message, as we're going to see as Paul goes on his missionary journeys. There's many Jews that didn't want to believe that because they were so stuck in their mindset of Judaism. Judaism they couldn't see it. And it's the same today. There's a lot of people that have, they're very myopic in their... Um, denomination, right? They're very mild. They, they, they see it that way. They're not open to what might be the truth in case they're following something that's not fully true. So we can point the fingers at the Jews, but we also look at ourselves. You know, we have to be open to what does God's word say? Start with that. And the more you know it yourself, the more discernment you're going to have as you listen to someone like me or anybody else teach the word of God if, if they're, you know, on the right page. And the Holy Spirit will teach you too as you, as you read God's word. But this is what chapter 15 covered, and it was, uh, it was a defining point because now Paul and Barnabas are getting ready for their second missionary journey. But before we go on that journey, I wanted to point out, this is when Paul wrote the book of Galatians, right, kind of at the end of his first missionary journey and before his second missionary journey. This was the first epistle that Paul wrote. And I wanted to show you a couple of verses that show you how the book of Acts narrative written by Luke matches Paul's writings that Paul's writing, two different writers, but the same story. They both participated in the same story. In Acts chapter 9, Luke writes, Meanwhile, Saul, which was Paul, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. Right? That's what... We covered back in chapter 9. Well, Paul writes in Galatians, now in AD 49, For as you have heard my uh, previous way of life in, Ju in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia, which is covered. I was personally unknown to the churches in Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praised God because of me. All right, so that's Paul writing, but it corroborates what Luke wrote in chapter 9. If you read Galatians, I have time to go to it now, you'll, you'll have a much better understanding of Galatians now that we've read through chapter 15. 
because in Galatians, if you don't understand chapter 15 of Acts, you're not going to get the meat of Galatians. They fit together like a hand in glove. Why? Because Paul's writing Galatians right after the Jerusalem Council, right? Because that was a contention. Because you read through Galatians, it's all about circumcision and following the law and all that. Well, this is how it fits in. And I'll show a couple more examples of, of how the letters and Acts fit together a little bit later on. Next slide. So we're going to stay on this slide for a little bit. We're going to kind of walk through Paul's and second missionary journey. So they're in Antioch, and they, they decide, Paul and Barnabas decide, you know what, let's go back and visit the churches we planted and see how they're doing and minister and, and grow and bring them the good news about, you know, not being under the law and so forth. But Paul, or excuse me, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, his cousin, and Paul didn't want him to go because he was mad, I guess, that he left him before, on the first missionary journey. So there was quite a dispute between them, the Bible says. So Paul takes Silas and heads out on his missionary journey, and the Bible says Barnabas and Mark, John Mark go back to Cyprus. So I see it as just God using, now he has two missionary trips, right? And as we read through Acts, too, we, we, we have a lot of characters we're getting to know, Paul and others. But it doesn't mean there wasn't other things going on, right? There's still disciples of Jesus is alive, Philip, for example, and Thomas and so forth. And so there's other missionaries. God's doing more than just this. But for whatever reason, this is what he preserved in his word for us to know about, okay? So chapter 16, they, st they start their... Um, their trip, and they go from Tars, they go back through Galatia, which is where the first churches were planted. And there's Cilicia, that's where Paul was born, Tarsus. So Paul's very familiar with this area, because that's where he was born and raised, right? And they go back through and they visit um, the churches. Um, and they get to Derby, and then they go to Lystra, and that's where they find Timothy. The Bible says Timothy, uh, his mother was, they were believers, and she had a house church, and, um, but, her, but she was Jewish, and her husband was Greek. And so they picked up Timothy, and, and he's, you know, he joins them on their missionary journeys. And he was, he was a young man. And for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, the Bible doesn't say, it says Jim, Timothy got circumcised. We just read how he didn't have to get circumcised. But it says, the Bible says in chapter 16, he got circumcised because the Jews knew his father was a Greek. That's what the Bible says. What it tells me is Timothy was all in. He didn't have to get circumcised, but he did it because he didn't want any dissension with the Jews. He was committed. And what which follows the narrative, because you fast forward 20 years, and he's a leader of the biggest church, one of the largest churches in Christendom, in Ephesus, right? But here's a young man. He got circumcised, but he joins them. And they go, and they go to Antioch, Iconium and Antioch. But then, um, for whatever reason, the spirit of Jesus, the Bible says, the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, tells Paul, do not go into Asia, which is that big province loaded with future churches, but right now there's no churches in Asia. And so um, he has to bypass Asia. That's why they go all the way around. And then when he gets up towards uh, My Mysia, he says, don't go into Bithynia, go around Mysia. And so Paul follows the spirit, and he goes to Troas. Now from Antioch to Troas is 350 miles. That's like walking from here to Honolulu and back. But a lot harder than walking on a flat water. It's, this is through some tough terrain. This was not easy. And the reason I mention that is when you, when, if, if you understand, and I know I repeat myself, but I just want to get the point across. If you understand the provinces, you know what they're talking about. When he says he had to bypass Asia and go through Asia and, and, and um, Bithynia, if you don't know what those places are, it's, it's just noise. You don't, you don't relate the story. You just think he's going, okay, that could be, a square mile that he goes past, or, you know, 10 miles. But the more you understand the provinces and the geography, the more the narrative makes sense. So Paul, they, they go a long way over a long time to get to Troas. The Bible doesn't say anything about what, what they did, but it was a lot of effort, let's put it that way. And they get to Troas, and Paul has a dream. And, and if he, the Spirit tells him, go to Macedonia. Where's Macedonia? It's across the water, uh, up in northern, today, northern Greece, but that's Macedonia. It becomes a very prominent place of churches in, in, in the future, but not now. But he, Paul was obedient. It says Paul was obedient to the Spirit. He, the next day, they took off into Samuel Trace, and they went over to Macedonia um, just because he had a dream. And so he goes to some of these churches and ends up in Philippi. And the Bible says that Paul and Philippi, Paul and Silas and Timothy... They go out 
they're looking for the place where people pray and they go by the water. And my understanding is if you didn't have enough men, you couldn't form a synagogue. I think it's either 10 or 20. And so Philippi probably didn't have a synagogue, so they had a place they go worship, like by a river or someplace open. But the Bible just says he goes by the uh, find a place of prayer, and he meets Lydia, and she becomes the first European con- convert. And it says she was a maker of purple from Thyatira, which if you were at a Revelation study last year, you would know that Thyatira, which is one of the churches in the book of Revelation, um, has a, um, this, this, this rock silt stuff that makes this purple dye. It was very, very valuable. Because purple is a ro- color of royalty. So a lot of royalty have purple robes and purple this, purple that. So anyhow, she was a maker of purple. And the reason I mean, that's a small little detail, but it fits the narrative of the real world. There really was, Thyatira had purple makers. It's a small detail, but it fixed factual history. So, and then it says Lydia basically not begged them, but encouraged them strongly to stay with them. And, he, and they did. So they stayed at Philippi. And this is their first um, time in Philippi. So why Paul's in Philippi, the Bible says this, um, this slave girl had a divination spirit in her. I guess she was like a fortune teller, and her owners made a lot of money off this. And she would call out, the spirit would call out to him, uh, to Paul, and he got annoyed with it, and he casted the spirit out. And her owners were very upset because they just lost their cash cow. And so they got the magistrates all in a while and, they, and, the, and the authorities, and they grabbed Paul and Silas. I'm assuming Timothy, it says Paul and Silas, and they threw him into prison and beat him first, beat him bad with rods, and they beat him up pretty bad, and they threw him in prison. It says they threw him in the inner prison, like the dungeon. And, that's what, and then what's it say Paul and Silas were doing? They were singing. Yeah. See, they knew their calling. They knew they, they, they weren't... They weren't detracted, right? I wish we were like that. I wish I was like that, right? How easy do we get distracted or detracted from doing God's work or anything? They were, they were laser focused. <laughs> Nothing stopped them, as we're going to see time and time again. But they're in prison, and, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, in the middle of the night, the, the, you, probably, you guys probably know the story. The angel comes, and the sh- uh, prison breaks, and the door opens, and the jailer wakes up next morning. He sees the door open. He's ready to kill himself because... He thinks they escaped, and so he might as well kill himself before his boss kills him. And then they're, don't kill yourself, we're here, we didn't leave. He's like, why did you leave? And then he becomes a Christian. And his whole household gets saved, the Bible says. So that's Philippi. So then from Philippi, they go through a couple places, um, Apollonia and so forth, and they end up at Thessalonica. And bo- the Bible says that they went to um, Thessalonica, is now chapter uh, 17. And it says they went to the synagogue for three consecutive Sundays. And preach Jesus from the Old Testament. Every city they go to that has a synagogue, the first thing they do is they go to the synagogue. Romans 1.16, for the gospel for the Jews first and then for the Gentiles, right? And they knew that. Well, Paul wrote that. But he, and remember, this is the gospel that Jesus gave him. Paul, you're a Pharisee. You know the law better than most. You studied on one of the biggest teachers in Israel at the time, Gamaliel. You know the Old Testament. This is what I'm revealing to you. This is me. I am the Messiah of Israel. And Paul saw it because he knew the scripture. He probably knew scripture better than Paul's apostles. Or excuse me, Jesus' apostles. They were fishermen, tax collectors. They were nobody, which is great. God shows he can use nobody to change the world. So only God can do that. But Paul was different. He was different. Being a Pharisee, he saw Jesus who he was, and that's what he preached. And that was why people believed because it wasn't just believe in Jesus, this guy that died hundreds of miles away in Judea. This was the Messiah. Look what's written here. And that's what he did. And then they were accompanied by miracles and signs of wonders, which will always accompany the Spirit, by the way. So they're in Thessalonica. They preach Jesus. Some believed and some didn't. And the ones that didn't got riled up. And they, the Bible says they went to Jason's house where Paul was staying to try to find him. And they kind of arrested them. Um, Jason, and then after pain, they were released, and then they, they found Paul and, and Silas and Timothy, and they, at night, it says, at night, they hush, ushered under Berea, which was the next stop. And so it says they got to Berea at night, under cover of dark, and it says they went to the synagogue at night, that's what this Bible says. But something happened in Berea that's very encouraging. The Bible says the Bereans were different than the Thessalonians, the Jews. They were more noble, the Bible says. 
Why were they more noble? The Bible, yep, yep, some of you know this story. They were, more, they were more noble because they didn't get offended by Paul's message. They took what he said and they searched the scriptures daily, the Bible says, to see if what he was saying was true. And then it said many believed, and also a lot of wealthy people believed as well. I don't know why it says that, but I guess they, a lot of wealthy people believed. So the Bereans, if you ever hear the saying, be like a Berean, that's just saying, do your own research, right? Is it true? Well, go find out for yourself. But the Bereans were noble, and they were, um, they searched the scriptures daily, and many, many believed. But as happened before, in Antioch and Pisidia, in the first journey, the Thessalonica Jews found out they were preaching at Berea, and they chased them over there, and they got mad at Berea. These, these Jews were offended. They did not want this Gentile thing, this message of the Gentiles. This isn't, this isn't what they, they weren't ready, they weren't open to it. And they weren't just like, I don't believe it, whatever. They were like, I don't believe it, I want to kill you. I want to cause you harm. You can't say this. So they chased them down to Berea. And the Bible says they, uh, the Bereans they, uh, ushered Paul to the coast and he left to go to Athens, which is going to be his next stop. But it says they left um, Timothy and Silas behind in Berea. And then when, the, when um, Paul's escorts, the Bereans that took him to Athens, when they dropped him off, Paul said, please send Timothy and Silas as soon as you can to, to meet me down here. Because now they went from Macedonia in the north, which is the province that had Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And now they're in the province of Achaia, which is southern Greece, which has Athens and Corinth. And Corinth was the biggest city at the time. It was a huge city. It was right in an Isthmus. You know what Isthmus is, where you have two land masses that are connected by a little thing, and there was this Anyhow, it was a lot of commerce. It was, it was a very big city. Um, so Paul goes to Athens. And at Athens, uh, the Bible says that Paul goes into the marketplace and he's preaching Jesus. And then he's up on a place called um, Mars Hill or the Areopagus, Areopagus uh, which is this hill in, in Athens. And he preached Jesus. And it said there was all these idols. And there was one that had, they all had names on them, you know, Zeus and Jupiter and whatever. And then they had one that could do the unknown God. The Bible says, Paul said, he preached that. I preached you of the unknown God. And, and then he preached Jesus. And some said, this guy's a fool. And others said, come back. I want to hear more of what you have to say. All right. So he's in Athens for a bit. And then he goes to Corinth, which is west. And this is, now we're getting close to the end of his second missionary journey. He gets to Corinth. And this is where he meets Aquila and Priscilla. And Paul says they were, or the Bible says they were Jews from Rome. They had been kicked out of Rome by Caesar. I guess Caesar had exiled Jews from Rome at the time. And so they're here in a, um, Corinth, and they're tent makers, just like Paul. So it says Paul worked with them. And Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth. This is only a three-year journey at the most. So half his time of this whole journey is spent in Corinth. So that's kind of why we have these big letters to the church of Corinth, right? We have one and two. It's actually four, but we have one and one and two, we call. Um, but Paul wrote more than just the two letters, but two are in Scripture. But So this was the beginning of the Corinthian church. And Paul went there from Athens. And he met Aquila and Priscilla. And, and so they're there for a while. And, and, and uh, basically he's preaching in the synagogues. He got upset with some of the Jews. They just were giving him a hard time. He says, you know, I'm done with you. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Same thing he said in Antioch on his first trip. You guys, I'm, I'm going to the Gentiles. But he preached Jesus relentlessly in Corinth from the Old Testament. Um, and then when they leave, Aquila and Priscilla leave with him. So him, Silas, Timothy, Aquila, Priscilla, uh, maybe even others, they go to Ephesus. And this is where the church at Ephesus gets planted, on the very end of Paul's second missionary journey. Ephesus was a, it was a capital of Asia. It was a huge Roman city. It was, a, it was a quite a large metropolis. And so unlike Judea, where Christianity started in the backwoods of Galilee, and, you know, Samaria. This is now, it's in, the, it's in the big city. It's the big time. This is the Paris's, London's, New York's of, of the known world. This, this is, these are big metropolises. Not that they didn't plant churches other places, but this is what the Bible says, these churches. So they're in Ephesus, and they're there for a bit, uh, and they plant the church. They leave Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus, so they become the church leaders at Ephesus. And then they leave, and they sail all the way back to Jerusalem, Jerusalem. 
uh, bring some money for the Jews there they were collecting for the church of uh, Judea, and they go and um, uh, back through Damascus, back to Antioch, sharing the good news of all the things that have happened. And so that was Paul's second missionary journey. One thing I do want to mention is that while he was in Corinth for that year and a half, he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. So those are the next two letters that he wrote. And so when you read those letters, you're going to get more context out of those letters knowing that. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of that in a bit. But so on this trip, he wrote two letters, and there was First and Second Thessalonians, and he wrote that in Corinth. Uh, the um, Galatians was written in Antioch before the second trip. Okay. Um, so what I want to do now, uh, before we start the third missionary journey uh, in our time remaining, I just want to show you some, some real places to put, put some pictures to what we're talking about. Because like I said earlier, the Bible is based on real places. Archaeology can prove it. It's not some fantasy land or fairy tale. It's real people in real places. Um, so go ahead and show the Philippi slide. This is Philippi, the ruins today. And that's up in Macedonia in northern Greece. And before, that ship was used to drive yeah, it was a building before. A long time ago. Um, next slide. And this is Berea. They actually have a statue for the Apostle Paul in Berea today. Is there, I think there's an airport named after Paul in, I think, I think it's Thessalon Thessalonica. Thessalonica, it has a different name now. Uh, I think that's the city, but they have airports named after Paul. Um, next slide. This is Athens. That's Mars Hill on, the, on your left. The Parthenon. That's where, I, that's where Paul preached 2,000 years ago. First time in Athens someone preached Jesus crucified. Rose from the dead. And then the last one I'm going to show you is Corinth. These are the ruins at Corinth. Okay, next slide. So earlier I showed you a couple of verses out of Galatians and Acts chapter 9 that kind of matched. This is um, out of 1 Thessalonians, um, how it kind of matches with Acts 16. So Acts 16, which we just talked about, this is in Philippi. It says, the crowd joined in attacking them, it's Paul and Silas, and, and the magistrates tore their garments, tore off their clothes, and gave orders to beat them with rods. And they, were, uh, and they had inflicted many blows upon them, and they threw them into the prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. So they're in the dungeon in stocks. So now Paul's in Corinth, as we just talked about, and he's writing back to the Thessalonians. Remember, he went from Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea to Athens, or, um, and then to Corinth. So he's in Corinth, and he writes to the Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonians. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had been already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. See how that fits? Acts 16 tells us about what happened in Philippi. Fast forward, he's in Corinth now, and he's writing back to Thessalonica. So obviously when he went to Philippi to Thessalonica, they knew that he had been beaten and put in prison. But these are two different writers, two different times writing this stuff, right? This isn't the same author. So. And there's many, many more. As, as, you, as, as you understand Acts, people and places, the epistles are going to come alive in context. And context defines meaning. You can't... Because if you don't define meaning, you can just read an epistle and, and say what you want. And if you don't know the context, you're not going to know if that's right or wrong. And it happens all the time. It's called helicopter preaching. People take a verse and just start preaching on it, but it's totally out of context. And you have to know how it was written. It was written for a purpose. God doesn't make mistakes. He wrote it by someone to someone at a time for a particular purpose. You have to know that context. Um, next slide. And this is uh, Ephesus. So after Corinth, they went to Ephesus, and these are some ruins from Ephesus. Ephesus, was, like I said, was a huge, huge city, um, big coliseums. They had the biggest library in the world in Ephesus. 
They also have the, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the um, temple to Diana or Artemis. It's a huge temple. And as we're going to find out next week in Paul's third missionary journey, that comes into play big time because he spends three years in Ephesus next time around on the third journey. And the, a lot happens in Ephesus, but we'll get there next week. Okay, next slide. So the oh, okay. I'm sorry. This is the second. Um, got ahead of myself here. This is the second uh, example I wanted to show you how the how Acts and the Thessalonian letter match up. So remember in Acts, uh, but the Jews they followed. Um, Paul and Silas to Berea. So the Jews came. Um, when they found out Paul, they were in Berea also. They came there too, agitated and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there in Berea. Those who um, con conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after this, receiving the command, Paul asked him to have Silas and Timothy come to them as soon as possible. They departed and left Paul in Athens. Remember, we covered that. Well, as Paul writes to the Thessalonians in his first uh, letter, in chapter 3, it says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. So Paul, as he writes the letter back to the Thessalonians, he's saying, Timothy's came. Just as Paul asked them, because when Paul left, when they left Athens, they asked the Bereans to send him down. He came. So once again, just another example of collaboration. Next slide. This is Paul's prison cell in Philippi. It's not quite like the prisons we have today. <laughs> and as we as we kind of wrap up tonight. Um, just want to kind of go over uh, next n what we're going to cover next week. Um, in two weeks, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So the eleventh next uh, Sunday night we have the kids play or the Christmas play, which I encourage everyone to go check out. And then on the eighteenth we're going to do our third uh, our third journey and, and the fourth. If you go and put that map back up, please. Oh, when you. So the I mentioned. Uh, so they, after they get back to Antioch, they, they spend some time here, but not, not a lot of time. And then Paul and Silas and Timothy again start off and go uh, on the third missionary journey. This is a longer journey. This one's five years. And a lot happens. And he writes more letters. He writes First and Second Corinthians, Romans. And they go back through Galatia and revisit the churches they planted. This time they go through Asia. Then they go around it. They go right back to Ephesus. And then they go back to Macedonia, Corinth, and back up around and, and then back um, to Jerusalem. And so this is our, the beginning of our church. This is the guys that, these are the guys that God used to spread the gospel. And remember, the gospel is defined in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. Jesus died according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose again according to the scriptures. It's not Jesus died and rose again. Man can do that, not rise again. But man can't die according to the scriptures, buried, rose again according to the scriptures. The, that part, that's, that's our faith. And we need to be able to grasp that and share that. Because that's what Paul shared. That's why people believed. Because they pointed to this miracle that's not humanly possible. And that's what the church needs to be preaching now. I'm, not just, I'm just talking about the church in general, Western church. People need something definable that they can believe in. It's not a feeling. It's not a social club. It's not programs. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once you receive that, the power of the Spirit goes through you. And you walk in the Spirit. Just like Paul. Everything they have, we have. Jesus said, I give you more than, I'm, I'm, to his disciples, to, to, the, to I. I give you more. I give you more. Not that... Things, you know, building community and relationship is not awesome when you're part of a church family. But you have to know the gospel and it has to be preached. And then we have to know how to share it. Because people need to hear it. Yes. And I'll close with this. If you go to a non-believer or a non-churchgoer, 
just think of somebody you might know. And you say, why don't you go to church? Or why aren't you a Christian? What, what will they say? A lot of answers might be, you know, I, I used to go to church. It just wasn't for me. That's why I said go to church or be a Christian, right? I don't need to go to church. That's fine. They can be. Oh, they're not saved in the first place. Oh, a bunch of hypocrites. Yes. Sorry. So where my head is. Um, forgive me, Lord. But the, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you're going to get all these answers. But my point is the answer you're not going to get is, you know, I heard the gospel and I studied it and I saw that God prophesied over 300 times that Jesus would come and he came exactly when he's told and that he was persecuted, like it says in Psalms, and he was buried, like it says in um, Zechariah, like it says in Isaiah, and he rose again on the third day. I see the gospel, but I just don't feel like believing. You're not going to hear that because people don't know. Yeah, and, and my point is not to say that. It's just to, that the gospel is powerful if you preach it. Because that's what Paul did. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here. I'm just pointing to what, this is what God, this is the message God chose to b build the church. And I don't know why we need to change it today. Or over the last couple hundred years, the last couple thousand years. This is very, very powerful when you, when you grasp and understand it. Um, is that a question or what is that back there? <laughs> Are you waving? Hey, Rich. Well, first of all, so Paul was a Pharisee. So he had a right to go and share at a... At a Matter of fact, in Antioch, in the last week when we talked about Antioch and his first missionary journey, they invited them to speak. They were visitors, and they said, come, share. And Paul got up, and it's a, read it, uh, Acts chapter 14, uh, or 13. Paul, it's a, long, it's a long sermon, and he goes all through the Old Testament, through our forefathers, from the Exodus to the uh, Davidic kingdom, all the way down the line to the prophets. And he says, this is the Jesus that they told you about. And it says they were so enthralled with the message, they asked him to come back next week, and the whole town came, and that's when the Jews got jealous because the crowds got big. But that's the message he preached. So as a Pharisee, he was able to speak in the synagogues. So... Yes, a false gospel. Yes, what's being said is basically the, the, the original gospel is pure, and, but it can't be modified, like genetically modified, like say a seed, but sometimes it is, and that's called false teaching, right? And the Bible says there will be false teaching. Matter of fact, in read Galatians, Paul's first letter, the very first chapter, he says, why do you preach anything other than we preach to you? There's already false teaching back in the very beginning. And Paul called them out on it. So I encourage you to read uh, Galatians after tonight. And I think you have a little more context. But he calls them out. Don't believe any other gospel that which we gave you. Because I didn't get it from man. I got it from God. And that's what Paul's saying to the church at, at Galatia. Or the group of churches at Galatia. Okay. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your gospel. I thank you for the truth. I thank you for the power that you've given each one of us to carry your message forward in the way we live, in our relationship with you, but also proclaiming your word, Father, proclaiming the truth that you gave the prophets and the law of Moses that was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. We give you all the glory and honor. Amen.